Hello Epic 7, and welcome to season number 7 of Ancient Inheritance and my guide on how not to be terrible at this event. If you are a veteran to Ancient Inheritance, this will serve as a recap, but if you're new to this event, this will be a solid dive into tips and tricks to help you succeed and make the most out of this event. Now, before we start, many of us saw the Meruin Express Mail bonus clip that was released about a month ago. It talked about a new Ancient Inheritance dungeon called Ancient Dragon's Legacy. They showed some images from the April Fool's event side story, talked about raiding a dragon's tomb and accessing the treasure therein, and showed a lot of new animation and graphics. Now, I'm not entirely sure if that's planned for the normal Ancient Inheritance season or if we're getting an additional AI-style event because the April Fool's event went over so well. Regardless, they said that's scheduled to hit in the second half of 2023, and hey, we're in the second half of 2023, but Ancient Inheritance does come out every three months, almost on the nose. That means sometime in November, we're scheduled to have another Ancient Inheritance, so I wouldn't hold my breath that this one is going to be any different from the last one. In fact, safe money is, this is going to be a cut and paste of the last Ancient Inheritance, just with new maps and new gear sets. Now, speaking of new gear sets, what's available this year in Ancient Inheritance is a Lifesteal set. And not just any Lifesteal set, all of the stats look pretty good. I mean, none of these pieces look bad. There's no wasted stats, no effectiveness or effect resistance. The stats on the ring look a little bit odd, but even that could be used on a handful of units. So, it's a fantastic set. And I think a lot of units can benefit from this. Personally, I'm hoping my Lionheart Sermia or Remnant Violet get good solid upgrades from this. This event is for everyone. Now some of you may be thinking, but Wolf, I'm pretty new to this game. I don't have many units and my gear is pretty bad. I can't compete in this. Well, that's just not true. I can't emphasize this enough. This content is for everyone, even you. You see, Ancient Inheritance is set up with several normalization mechanics that let it be accessible to everybody. In fact, everyone can compete on pretty much the same level. You'll be able to compete along with people who've been playing this game for upwards of four years. Let me explain. First, there's an enlisting system, which only allows you to draft a handful of units, uh, 10 at the start, and you get additional unit slots as you level up. I think it caps out in the upper 30s towards the end of the event. So having a deep pool of units doesn't really matter that much because you can only take a handful through this entire event. Second, and this is the best part, every single unit, once you enter Ancient Inheritance, is immediately upgraded to level 60, 6 star, max awakened, max mola, ready to go right out of the box like a fully upgraded unit. Now unfortunately once you leave Ancient Inheritance it reverts back to its prior form, but you can use a level 5 unit that you've done nothing to and it will perform just like a maxed out unit. And the best part is some of the strongest units in Ancient Inheritance are 3 star and 4 star units. Like check out my boy Fire Kawazu here. He's actually one of the best warriors for Ancient Inheritance and he's a 4 star unit. And even built like this, he's responsible for one of my highest scoring teams in this event. But what about gear you ask? Well, that's covered too. The third normalization mechanic is that gear stats don't really matter. Well, I mean they don't matter much. I believe it's about a 10 to 1 ratio, and what I mean by that is the stats on the gear, only about 10% of that impacts your stats inside of Ancient Inheritance. For example, let's say you have speed boots that give you 40 speed as the main stat, well you're only going to see 4 speed reflected out of those boots. That weapon that has a 25% crit chance on it, yeah, that's only giving you about 2.5% crit chance. There's such a small impact from the gear that you could use unleveled gear and still succeed. Now what does matter is gear sets. The full impact of the gear set bonus is carried over, so you'll still get the full benefit from the crit chance off of a crit set, you'll get the full benefit of a speed set, the full benefit of the bonuses for having an attack set, and of course, special things like lifesteal, counter set, pen set, all of these matter. So you can take some of the most trash gear you've got and cobble together sets for the set bonuses and jump right into the event. Oh, and on a side note, artifacts work with the full value of the artifact. No normalization there. 
So, where do your stats come from? Well, that brings us to the fourth and final special mechanic for Ancient Inheritance, and that is the mechanic that puts us all on an equal footing. We all enter Ancient Inheritance with the exact same stats. Stats come from a special class enhancement system. In Ancient Inheritance, you don't build units, you build classes. And as you level your classes, they get bonuses, which impact the stats of all units of that class. This is where 99% of your stats come from. You see, when you do things in Ancient Inheritance, you gain experience points. And those experience points can come from fighting monsters, reading books, even just walking around. And as you gain experience, your levels go up. And as your levels go up, you gain class enhancement points. And you can use these points to make a class type stronger. As you level classes, all units in that class get massive stat boosts. So for this reason, you want to focus on a primary class plus Soul Weavers, and maybe nurture a secondary class. I can't stress this enough. If you want to be an asset to your guild and proc really high numbers, pick one or two classes in addition to Soul Weavers and stick to them. Ignore all the rest of the classes. You do not want to be a jack of all trades, master of none. That's the number one mistake people make in Ancient Inheritance, and more than anything, it will stunt your growth. Now let's talk about what's required to participate. In order to participate in Ancient Inheritance, you'll need to be level 40, which you probably already will be by the time you join a guild. And your guild will need at least 16 members to initiate Ancient Inheritance. Now don't worry, if people drop out of your guild after you've started and you drop below 16 members, you won't be locked out. Once you're in, you're in. However, you really want to be in a guild that has a lot of very active members. You see, at its core, Ancient Inheritance is guild-based PvE. Your advancement and success is tied to your guildmates, and theirs is tied to you. So you really want to be part of a guild with a lot of active members. This will really min-max your Ancient Inheritance experience as well as your entire Epic 7 experience, so if you're in a guild that's falling short of expectations, hit me up. Though space is relatively limited, I do have several guilds that are recruiting from early game to top end game level of play. So if you need help finding a new home, click that link in the description to jump in my Discord and check out the Guild Recruitment Hall to get in touch with one of our many recruiters. Or drop me a DM directly and I'll see what I can do to help you out. Now that we've covered joining guilds, and I hope I've driven home by now that this event is for everyone and anybody can participate, let's talk about how to prepare for this event and the three things that really matter above all else. Gear sets, classes, and artifacts. First, let's talk about gear sets. Although gear stats don't matter that much, gear set bonuses certainly do. Now because of the fast way that leveling in Ancient Inheritance ramps up your skills, you'll find probably by level 5 or 6 that you don't really need any more boosts to stats like effectiveness, effect resistance, or crit chance, or even crit damage. So I don't recommend sets that boost those stats. These highlighted sets are really good sets to focus on for Ancient Inheritance. Top of this list of course is Attack Set as well as Rage Set. Attack has no functional limit, and Rage Set, well, almost every single mob that you fight in Ancient Inheritance will have a debuff, so Rage Set is money. Life Steal is also really good, especially if you start running out of healers. In fact, there are some fights where a Life Steal set and a healing artifact may be all you need. We have Free Unequip this weekend. Use it to slap gear on units you never thought you would use. I'll provide a list of units for each class that I strongly recommend using inside of Ancient Inheritance. You'll want to have a couple dozen units pre-built because once a unit is used inside of Ancient Inheritance, even if it doesn't die, you can't use that unit again for the rest of the day. Next, I want to take a moment to talk about artifacts. You get the full stat and effect bonus of artifacts there's no normalization process for them. In the early game, it's great to have artifacts that boost stats that you'll need until your class levels get higher. Below level five or six, you're probably gonna notice that many of your units don't have enough crit chance to reliably crit. This can be overcome with artifacts that boost crit chance, such as Midnight Bloom or Black Hand of the Goddess, Azure Comet, other such artifacts. The same can be said for artifacts that boost effectiveness when debuffs are needed. Artifacts can later be replaced with other more suitable artifacts once your enhancements have got your skills capped out. Then you'll want to consider artifacts that give debuffs for the priest fight. 
These are very important. Things like Junkyard Dog, Cradle of Life, Sierra Ren, Song of Stars, and so on. These can really help with the priest fights, and but they're dependent on the classes you've picked. And of course, damage dealing artifacts are huge. Though it's a little bit expensive, I think you'll find it's worth your while to move artifacts around before more important fights. Even if it's just temporary, yeah, I know it's a chunk of gold, but move those artifacts. I mean, do you want those sweet rewards or not? Now let's talk about the class enhancement system. As I said before, as you move around and do things in Ancient Inheritance, you gain experience points, which levels you up and gives you class enhancement points. When you level up, you get these enhancement points, and you can use those points to, le to level up a class. Not individual units, but the entire class. This is the reason you want to limit yourself to just two or three classes tops. I strongly recommend one of those classes be Soul Weavers unless you really know what you're doing. Here's an example of a tree that I built in Season 2. As you can see, I focused on Warriors, Soul Weavers, and Rangers, and I ignored the rest. Now you can pick just about any class and be successful. You just want to be focused. You don't want a skill tree that looks like this. Now this is a fake skill tree, but I think you see what I mean. It's much better to have two level 15 classes and maybe a level 12 sec third class than to have four or five level 6 classes. Pick one or two classes plus weavers and stick to them. Otherwise you'll probably be one of the lower scoring players in your guild, you'll struggle to complete content, and you'll have an overall disappointing run. I really want to drive this point home. Take a look at this Asaria. On the left is what a ranger looks like at level 4, and on the right is what her stats look like at level 10. You can only imagine what she'll look like at level 15. Now let's talk about classes in general for a minute. Unless you really know what you're doing, soul weavers are a cornerstone class and you should pick them and share your class enhancement points equally with your primary class until you get to like level 8 or 9, then you can start hard focusing the primary class. As for a primary class, Warriors have always been my favorite, and I think it's Smilegate's favorite too, because for some reason, Warriors get a higher base stat than any other classes in the game. More importantly, Warriors have an insane depth and breadth of units, from self-sustain, to debuffing, to defense breaking, to raw damage and tankiness, dual attack Warriors, they have it all. I've always played Warriors in Ancient Inheritance, and will probably make them one of my primary classes again this season. A good, solid option to Warriors are Mages. Mages are machines of murder. They bring insane damage and debuffs. They're a little difficult to run early on, as they're lacking a little bit in tankiness, but you gain a lot of unique tools like Angel of Light Angelica and Auxiliary Lots, and artifacts like Spirit's Breath and Taga Hill's Book. Last season I ran mages as a secondary class and wound up getting them to level 15 and I really enjoyed the results. At a high level, mages are powerhouses. Knights are also a fantastic class who's able to solo certain mini bosses in Ancient Inheritance. Uh, they're used in many cheese comps. They're a class that everyone used to steer away from because they're considered not that good, especially versus the priest fight. And I'll be honest with you, Landy might have changed that. Naval Captain Landy might have changed that. And I'm going to try Knights out this season as my secondary class and see what I can do with them. I hope it works out. Rangers are a popular class, but I don't recommend them as a primary class. They're a great secondary class. Most people pick Rangers to access Asaria to power up their Tamarin and also for target debuffs. Well, we now have other options for target debuff, including warriors like Mui and mages like uh, ML Laika, but rangers are still king in this regard. More rangers bring target debuffs and have the uh, Song of Stars artifact. Rangers fall short a lot of the time because they have few strong powerhouse units. I mean, you've got Green Landy, and that's really about it. They do have a lot of great self-sustain artifacts like Bloodstone, but pound per pound they feel a little bit lacking in power when it comes to a primary class. Thieves, for some reason Ancient Inheritance gives Thieves less stat than any other class, and I don't know why. 
Thieves, for the most part, are already relatively squishy. You find yourself relying on evasion kits a lot, and we all know how that can go. But thieves do really have a good breadth of kits. They bring a decent amount of sustain through lifesteal. They have a lot of damage and a lot of a lot of debuffs, but they're missing some of the important debuffs like defense break. Not many thieves bring that. They just don't have the tankiness of warriors, the damage of mages, or the cheese ability of knights. You can pull off really good thief teams, but I rate them right up there with rangers. They're a great secondary class, but I'm not sure I would make them my primary. If you have some of these units and you've decided which classes you want to run, start gearing them up. It's free on equip. Slap the world's crappiest gear on them as long as they have gear on them, as long as they have the proper sets on them. Don't worry about their Mola or Stigma. Don't worry about their level. All of that is maxed out as soon as they go into Ancient Inheritance. Doesn't matter if that Rage set has an effectiveness main stat. Who cares if it's a green piece you bought from the secret shop? Cobble your sets together. Load up these uh, units and get them ready to pick an Ancient Inheritance. And rack up some insane scores for your guild. On day one, when Ancient Inheritance drops, you want to make sure that the first thing you do is go into Ancient Inheritance. Not kidding, make this the first thing you do that day. Even if you don't have time to play Epic 7, just enter the dungeon, have your unit appear on the map, select your starting relic, and then you can exit out and go do whatever it is you need to do that day. The reason for this is, if the rest of your guild collects rewards, you will only be eligible to receive the group rewards when you're inside of Ancient Inheritance. If, they, if you aren't on the map and they collect rewards, you'll miss out. And nobody wants to miss out on rewards. So especially if your guild is active, you want to make sure you are in the fight. You are on the map so you get the rewards that they collect. So day one, jump in, get yourself on the map. That way you're eligible. You don't want to miss out on anything because you're AFK, right? As for that starting relic, this is the decision that will impact your entire Ancient Inheritance event. Your starting relic. There are two really good ones and one kind of okay one. The rest are pretty garbage in my opinion. We've mathed out the differences and Wanderer's Pipe still seems to be the best bang for your buck. Unless they change it, Wanderer's Pipe will get you the most experience out of any relic. A very close second is Exploration Journal. The only negative to Exploration Journal is you have to use objects and the big object you want to use are books and chests. You probably aren't going to be opening many chests, and books are a limited use item. Only five people in your guild can use any book before it is locked out. So if you're late to the game or you have lots of other people in the guild with Exploration Journal, you might not get those books and you might struggle for experience. Now, if you don't get Wanderer's Pipe or Exploration Journal, the mediocre third option would be the Wooden Spatula. It gives you five extra provisions per day. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you add it up, it's basically an entire day's worth of provisions. So you get 15 days worth of movement, whereas the rest of your guild only gets 14 days. So it does add up and it will let you progress nicely. The other relics aren't that good. So if you don't see one of these three relics on your first list, you can click that refresh button at the bottom of the screen once. Then you have to select from the three it gives you. Hopefully the three it gives you on the second screen are one of the three that you want. If you don't get any of the three good relics, it doesn't mean your event is ruined. It just means you aren't going to be able to min-max it as much as you'd probably have wanted to, but you'll still be able to accomplish all your goals, so don't panic. Your game's not over. Now every day, I will try to post videos of my travel through Ancient Inheritance to give you an idea on how to handle fights we've come across. Once you're ready to go, the best way to play this, in my opinion, is to organize your guild, rush the priest, and don't waste provisions collecting statues on floor one. The boost just isn't worth it that early on. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to get from level two to level three, so using that statue is just kind of a waste of provisions, in my opinion. Chests also have pitiful rewards on floor one and two, and monster fights give very low XP and gold. Skip all of that. Focus your provisions on helping the guild, helping the entire guild beat the floor one and two priest. Captains need to organize the guild. Focused push on the priest 
sparing maybe two or three members to go on side missions to collect the guild chests if they're worth it. This will maximize the amount of time your entire guild gets to spend farming the sweet, sweet loot on the higher, more profitable floors. You don't want to get your loot on until the last few days anyway. Now, every guild has them. Loot goblins. Loot goblins are people who just don't get this. They're not team players. They don't read instructions. They're obsessed with chests. They can't stop staring at chests. They open every one they can find along the way because who can walk by a shiny chest and not just want to dive right in? It's every guild's organizer or captain's job to try to make sure they mitigate loot goblin activity as much as possible. Discourage it. You likely won't be able to stop it, but do your best to curtail it. This will help your entire guild progress faster. Now, speaking of efficiency, on a personal level, provisions are unforgiving. There is no undo button, so go slow. Count the hexes. Take the time to make sure that you have the provisions needed to get the job done. Like on this map here, I wanted to go down and get that scroll before fighting the priest. As you can see, I have 16 provision. It'll take three to walk down to that scroll, three to use the scroll, and then five to walk back to the priest. That's 11 provisions, and that leaves me with five left. Well, it takes seven provisions to fight the priest on this floor, so I wouldn't have been able to attack today. So instead, I walked to the priest, I did my fight, and then I went and got the scroll another day. So to help plan out your best course, the brilliant mind of bread started making maps. A few seasons ago, I joined him on the map making team, and since then, the bread team has expanded to include a small but hardworking team of map makers who scrape data off of the Asian guilds who are a day ahead of us to make maps like this one from last season. These maps will always be posted in the description of the video, so feel free to copy them to help organize your guild or even just for your own personal movements. I will also post and make public the maps that I have made for my guild showing directions, instructions, and pathing. Now my pathing and instructions are of course for your reference only. Every guild should find their own way to organize their own guild team movements based on their own guild size and needs, but hopefully this will serve as a reference point and help you along. Well, now that I've talked your ear off and turned what I intended to be a short video into a long one, I'm going to wrap things up for this introduction video. Long story short, there doesn't seem to be any changes from last season other than the gear set rewards, as always, I plan to post my daily AI movements in the form of a walkthrough video to help guide you along in case you need some assistance. It's nice to have the strategies of fighting different bosses and to see the maps in advance and I hope you really enjoy those videos and that they help you out. And one last final note, I want to remind all of you, if you're not thrilled with your guild, click the link in the description of the video, join my Discord and hit me up. I'll help you find a home that will satisfy your needs and hopefully make your ancient inheritance and epic seven existence just that much better. Well, that's all for now. Have a great weekend and remember to smash everything. Smash like, smash subscribe, smash ML Landy, smash that bell, smash it all. And I will see you guys next time.